Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Mr. Kovalt and in this video I'm going to be going over calorimetry. I'm going to introduce you to calorimetry. So let's get into this. So in my previous video we were talking about um, the transfer of heat energy. We we're talking about specific heat, um, uh, the specific heat capacity of certain substances and how you can use Q equals the mass times the specific heat times the uh, the change in temperature in order to get the amount of heat or energy absorbed or released by an object. So we're going to continue that. We're going to use that, but now we're going to use it for the purposes of calorimetry. And what's the purpose of calorimetry? Well, the purpose of calorimetry is to measure the heat transferred from one object to another or the energy transferred during a chemical reaction. And so there's a few types of calorimeters. I'm not going to get into the details of uh, each different type of calorimeter. That'll be saved for another video. But um, I do want to at least mention a couple of them. One is a, a bomb calorimeter. That's where you have a pretty sturdy uh, container in which you have water and you have another container in which you are basically burning something and therefore the heat released from the substance you're burning is then released into the water and you can uh, calculate the temperature change of the water and then figure out um, how much heat was released from the uh, burning of the substance. Um, I believe this is uh, the way in which you find the number of calor uh, calories in a, in a uh, particular uh, food item or, or if you will. So um, you burn the substance, it releases heat and then that that is the number of calories that are in that particular uh, object, right? Uh, so the other kind of calorimeter is a more simple version. Uh, it's um, the bomb calorimeter is in a sturdy uh, container that's closed off to the rest of the environment. And so you're keeping it at a, a constant volume. And so uh, that's one way. The coffee cup calorimeter is another way in which it's a it's just a simple like take take two styrofoam coffee cups, nest them in together, and then you have water inside uh, one or you have whatever liquid you have or substance you have in, in the coffee cup. Uh, and then you can add stuff to it. You could add pour like a hot water or you could add a, a rea uh, another reagent to the coffee cup and then um, while the reaction is going or while the substances are mixing, you can uh, measure the temperature and mix the substances together in the coffee cup. You'll have to have a put a top on the coffee cup and a, th a thermometer through a hole. And then, and then you can get the uh, temperature change from that reaction or from that mixture. And then you can figure out like how much energy was transferred from one object to another. So you can take a hot object and put it into a cold substance and then measure the temperature change of the water as the uh, temperatures equilibrate and become the same temperature. So that's a couple of different um, uh, calorimeters you could use. Um, so uh, again, in another video, I'll go in more detail, but those are a couple of different types of calorimeters. Um, so what kind of questions can you be asked in calorimetry? Uh, so you might run across these following types of problems to solve, right? So maybe you're transferring a hot object into a cold liquid, right? Or maybe the opposite, you're transferring a cold object into a hot liquid. So in those cases, um, you're gonna get a heat transfer from the hot object to the cold liquid or from the hot liquid to the cold object until you get the same temperature, until the temperature evens out. And then at that point, you can uh, do your calculations to figure out how much energy was transferred from the hot substance to the cold substance. Um, uh, pouring two liquids together, I mentioned this before, you could, so you could have two liquids together. Um, they could be different temperatures, right? Or they could be the same temperature, but maybe they're different reactants. Maybe you're mixing hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide. So you're doing an acid-base neutralization and you pour them together and you want to measure the heat of that reaction. So you could, do, you could do it that way as well. So you're pouring two liquids together. They start off at different temperatures. Or again, they could start out 
at the uh, same temperature. That gets to the second point. Maybe you're calculating the heat of a reaction, the heat released or absorbed during a chemical reaction. That would be the example of the hydrochloric acid being mixed with sodium hydroxide. When you're pouring it into the calorimeter, they will react and release energy. And you can uh, measure the amount of energy released during that reaction if you know the mass and the specific heat and all that stuff. Right. So these are different types of problems you will run into in calorimetry. And um, because we're dealing with heat absorption and heat, uh, heat release, um, we're still going to be using this equation here. Remember, in my previous video, when I was talking about specific heat, I talked about this equation as a way of calculating the amount of heat absorbed or released by an object or by a solution or by you know, a liquid of some sort. So uh, we're still going to be using this one, Q equals M cat mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. But now we're going to be using this equation for multiple substances. So if I'm taking two substances and I'm mixing them together, or if I take a hot object and throw it into a cold liquid, I now have two substances that are involved in the heat transfer. So one substance is going to be gaining the energy. The other one is going to be releasing the energy. So in both cases, I'm going to now have to use this equation for each different sub substance, right? So if I have more than two substances, which is possible, like for example, if I have, for example, ice water and I have a chemical reaction that's happening in the solution with the ice, right? Then I'll have uh, heat being released maybe from the reaction, right? So that heat is then going to heat up the solution. It's going to melt the ice, right? So maybe the calorimeter is involved, right? So the calorimeter picks up heat as well. Usually we want to uh, form calorimeters or make calorimeters so that they absorb the least amount of heat, but there is a specific heat capacity or heat capacity for uh, your calorimeter. So maybe you might, uh, that might be involved. You might have to use uh, your calculation. So you, you would have uh, an equation for the melting of ice. You would have the equation for the absorption of heat to the solution. You'd have an equation for the release of heat from your reaction, right? So you would have a number of equations that would be fitting into uh, this problem. But uh, for this video and my uh, other video where I go over practice problems, I'm going to keep it to two. Um, but and maybe in a later video, I'll make more challenging problems and show you how, how to solve uh, calorimetry problems um, uh, when it's more complicated and you have more things involved. But the thing to remember is that the way in which you are solving the calorimetry problem is, this, uh, is the same way. So you're following the same procedure. And so it's all based on this second law of thermodynamics. Or I'm sorry, the first law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics I'll talk about in a moment. So um, that will bring me to the next part of this video. So we'll talk about the first law of thermodynamics and, and then show how you could use that understanding of the first law of thermodynamics to solve problems. So stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. So uh, now we're going to get into the first law of thermodynamics and how this relates to the transfer of energy and how this is actually going to help us with our calculations and our math. So we, let's remind ourselves what the first law of thermodynamics is. The first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So in these uh, calorimetry problems, we are transferring energy. So energy is going to be absorbed by one object that is uh, released by another, right? So one object releasing energy, another object is going to be absorbing that energy. And so in these kinds of processes and problems, we're assuming that no energy is lost to the environment. It's completely contained and closed system. So uh, here... Um, we have some examples. So uh, that means that energy in is going to be equal to the energy out. Energy absorbed by one object is going to be equal to the energy released by another object. And so to use numbers, uh, so if 20 joules of energy is uh, absorbed from 
uh, by an object, that means that 20 joules of energy had to be released by another object. So this one releases the energy, this one absorbs all of that energy. So that's the assumption we're making is that we're not losing any energy to, uh, to the surroundings, uh, we're, we're keeping it within the system. And so to make sure our math works out, um, since we're using Q, right? And so the equation Q equals M cat, right? Q is equal to the mass times the specific heat of the substance times the temperature change of that substance. Then uh, we're going to be using uh, that equation or Qs for each substance involved. And so we're only going to be dealing with two substances, um, but there could be more. But for the two substances, um, then we would have Q, whatever the amount of heat absorbed by one substance is going to be equal to the negative uh, of the Q or the energy that's released by substance number two. So that's what the negative means here. So they are equal but opposite to each other. So the energy uh, absorbed by this one is positive because it's being absorbed or gained. Um, but that amount of energy, the 20 joules, is equal to the amount of energy lost by this substance. So negative, you can think of as the loss of energy, the release of energy. This substance is losing the energy, so it's negative. This one's gaining, so it's positive. So they're equal but opposite. Another way that you could rewrite this, which is just as legitimate and okay, um, is that if you bring this one to the opposite side, then you'll have zero is equal to these two added together. So zero is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus, and then if you have others, they would be like Q3 plus Q4. But again, uh, in this video and when I do my practice problems video, uh, I'll, I'll keep it simple and just the two substances. And maybe in a future video, um, I will uh, make more complicated uh, problems. I'll go over some more complicated problems. But again, what I want to emphasize is the procedure or the way you go about solving a calorimetry problem is going to be the same regardless of how many substances you have involved, right? It's just going to require uh, more uh, equations and more calculations, but the steps and the way is, is the same. So, um, so now I'm going to continue in the video with uh, going over an example problem a little bit and to talk about where these negatives are coming from and, and go on from there. So stay tuned and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, welcome back. So I'm going to do an example with numbers. It's a pretty simple example, but it'll hopefully get the point across. And then I'll do the example with pictures and hope that that'll clarify anything that's still not clear. So here's the example. So you put a hot piece of metal into a cup of cold water. The water absorbs the 50 joules of energy. So the metal it releases 50 joules of energy. So again, we're, we're assuming no energy is lost in the environment. It's a complete transfer, 100%. And so in this case, uh, the Q of the water, the heat, change of the water uh, is, uh, the, is going to be Q here positive, right? Because it says the water absorbs, it's cold water and you have a hot object. So energy is always going from hot to cold, transferring from hot to cold. So the cold water is gonna absorb the energy, in this case, 50 joules. And so that's going to be Q water is our positive Q. Uh, and then we have equal to negative Q of the metal. So the metal is releasing that energy. So it's in the opposite direction or it's uh, happening opposite. Uh, so this is going to be the negative. Um, so the Q of the metal is releasing that energy. And so that in and of itself is going to be negative. So that remember this, this negative sign here is not negative. It just means opposite of. So this is going to be the opposite of this. So this is endo meaning endothermic. It's absorbing energy. This one is exo, meaning it's releasing energy. So that's what the negative is saying. And so uh, if when you do your calculation, uh, you're going to get a negative 50 joules here and you're going to get a positive 50 joules here. 
And so the, ne the negative sign here and the negative sign here will work itself out so that these sides are equal. So then 50 joules here is going to be equal to 50 joules here. And so they're equal together. And you could do the same thing with the other way. So if I have Q is equal to uh, Q of the water plus Q of the metal, then I put in the numbers. So Q of the water, again, is 50 joules. And this time, the Q of the metal, again, is going to be negative 50. So negative 50, right? So this negative kind of goes away because I brought it to the other side. So then it's just this negative here. So then this is zero, right? Oh, that should, I'm sorry. That should be zero. So zero is equal to QW plus QM, Q of the water plus Q of the metal, and then 50 joules plus negative 50 joules gives you zero, oops, zero. Or let me write that in the same way so it's not confusing. So zero is equal to zero, which is what you would expect. So again, the zero here is referring to the fact that no energy is lost. So the uh, change in energy uh, in one object is equal to the change in the energy, but it's opposite sign. So when you add them together, they should all cancel out and you get zero. So you could set it up this way or you could set it up this way as long as you're um, paying attention to uh, the negative signs and everything cancels out. Okay, so what, where are these negatives coming from? Well, you have to think about what's going on in the calculation. So we know that mass is always positive, right? There's no negative masses here. Uh, the uh, calorimetry, uh, the specific heat of the uh, substance is always positive. There's no negative specific heats. And uh, here is where we want to pay attention to. So the, the change in temperature, this can either be positive or negative. And remember in my last video, I talked about this a little bit where the, uh, the change in temperature is going to be positive or negative depending on whether you're absorbing or losing energy, right? So if you're going from a low temperature to a higher temperature, you are absorbing energy. And so when you do final minus initial, you're going to end up with a positive temperature change because you're absorbing heat and you're going from lower temperature to higher temperature. If you're losing heat, then you're going to go from a high temperature to a lower temperature and your lower temperature is your final temperature. So when you do final minus the initial, you're subtracting a higher temperature you end up with a negative temperature change. And so therefore Q is negative. So the negative value here, or I should say here, is because of the temperature change and you're doing final minus initial. So in this case here, uh, this object was losing energy. So the final temperature was lower than the original temperature. And so you get a negative value here. And so that's where that negative value is coming from. But uh, as long as you're following the equation and you're setting it up either like this or like this, um, as long as you're putting in your temperatures, your final temperature and your initial temperature in the right place and you're doing the calculation, the, uh, the, the negatives and positives should work out and you should end up with the right answer. Okay, so let me do uh, an example using pictures now. Okay, so here is my example with, uh, with uh, pictures. Oops, I forgot to change that. I should say pictures. Where's my... So example with pictures. All right, so remember, energy in is equal but opposite to the energy out. So they're, excuse me. So they're equal but opposite, meaning that um, they're, uh, one is going to be opposite of the others. Okay, so the, they're equal in magnitude. The amount is the same, but one is being absorbed, one is being released. Okay, so energy is absorbed. 
that's that value, that magnitude, the calculated value of Q is going to end up being positive because of the temperature change. You're going from lower to higher temperature because you're absorbing energy. Uh, the uh, Q value, the magnitude that you calculate using your Q equation, the Q equals MCAT, that should end up be giving you a negative value because energy is being released. And so uh, the temperature change for that substance is going to go from a uh, higher to lower temperature. And so you get that negative value. So uh, picture wise, here we have a block in water. So in this case, the water is hot and the block is cold relative to the water. And so in this case, energy or heat is going to move from the water into the block. So when you calculate the Q of the metal, that is going to end up giving you a positive charge. Uh, I'm sorry, a positive value because the block is going to increase in temperature as it's absorbing energy from the water, right? So it's going to go from a low temperature to a high temperature. And then, uh, so then the water is going to lose energy. And so it's going to decrease in temperature. And so the Q value of the water that you're calculating should end up being a negative value. But they're going to be equal to each other in magnitude. So negative 50 joules here, positive 50 joules there. Okay. And so um, the water, the hot water is going to cool down. The metal is going to heat up until they reach the same final temperature. So the final temperature for both of them is the same. I'll talk about that in a little, a uh, little later. Uh, so energy transfers from uh, into the metal, from the water, the colder water to the hotter metal. Okay. Well, what if it was the opposite situation? What if I have a colder block, or I'm sorry, a hotter block, and a colder water situation. In that case, the hot, the heat from the hotter block would transfer to the colder surrounding water. So you got cold water. So therefore the heat is going to transfer into the water. And in this case, the water is going to be absorbing the heat. So when you calculate the Q of the water this time, that's going to be a positive value. And since the metal is losing heat, it's going to decrease in temperature. And so then when you calculate Q, it's going to be a negative value. And so again, they're going to be equal, but opposite to, e to each other. So you got the cold water uh, is uh, he being heated up by the warm or hot block. And so energy is transfers into the water from the hot block. And so the key thing to remember here is that the magnitude, uh, I should say that the Q value, the amount of energy that is absorbed or released is going to be giving you a positive or negative value depending on what the temperature change is. And the temperature change depends on whether it's absorbing or uh, losing energy or heat. Okay. So let's talk about the final temperature and then uh, we'll be done with this video. And then in my next video, I'll talk about practice problems. I'll go over some example problems in which we solve using calorimetry and using our Q equation. So uh, just uh, bear with me in a moment. I'll be right back. Okay, so what's the key thing to note about final temperature? So as I was alluding to, um, if you leave the object or liquid or solutions long enough together, then what will happen is that the uh, amount of energy transferred will stop because they've become the same temperature in the end, right? So once they reach the same temperature, heat transfer basically stops or it's at least equal in so far as the amount of heat going into and out of the objects are the same. So once they reach that level or e of equilibrium, the temperature, the final temperature that they both end up at is going to be the same. And so the special thing about this is in that situation where they finally reach the same temperature, this will allow us to simplify the algebra in some of our problems so that we can solve the problems more easily for various things. And so that's what I have for this video. In my next video, I'm going to go over some practice problems involving calorimetry. So stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video, if this was helpful in any way, then please, by all means, 
like, share, subscribe to the video, hit that notification bell right down there or the like button right down there, hit that notification bell wherever it may be. And so that way you can be notified by all my videos. Hit that all button after you hit the, the notification bell. And uh, finally, put a comment down in the comment section below. Let me know what you think. Ask me questions. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day.